my name is Kristen Schaefer. I'm director of CHE, the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. And I'm zooming in today from San Jose, California on traditional Ohlone lands. I'm gonna kick us off with a few bits of housekeeping before we dive into today's conversation. So this webinar is scheduled to last for one hour and today's conversation is being recorded for our webinar archive and will be shared via email with everyone who registered for today's event. Um, everyone on the webinar right now is muted except today's speakers. And we do invite you to introduce yourself and where you're zooming in from in the chat box, if you like. We'll have time for discussion at the end of our session today. Please type any questions in the Q&A box as we go along um, and we'll get to as many as we can. We'll keep an eye on the chat as well, but we might miss your question there. So if you wanna be sure it's addressed, please drop it into the Q&A. Uh, so now I'd like to welcome you to today's Che Cafe. So to Mark Che's 20th anniversary year, we're having a series of these discussions with leaders in the field of environmental health and justice. The idea is to get to know a bit more about some of the people doing important work in the field, their stories, motivations, and perspectives. I'll share more about upcoming events in the series at the end of today's session. So for today's conversation, we'll start with some words from our panelists about how they came to this work. Then a round robin discussion about efforts they have been they have uh, been involved with or they're currently involved with, and some reflections on some recent findings about global cancer trends. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce today's panelists. First, Dr. Polly Hoppen is a research professor emerita and program director for environmental health at Lowell Center for Sustainable Production at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Over the course of a career in nonprofits, government, and academia, she has integrated understanding of links between exposures and disease with development of solutions, with a focus particularly on asthma and cancer. She's co-founder of the Cancer Free Economy Network and the Cancer and Environment Network of Southwestern Pennsylvania, and has held numerous leadership positions in a variety of organizations. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Polly in various capacities, and I'm very excited to have her with us today. Dr. Margaret Kripke is a professor emeritus also and founding chair of the Department of Immunology at the University of Texas Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Kripke is a leading expert in the immunology of skin cancers and served multiple terms on the three-person president's cancer panel, which oversees the development and implementation of the national cancer program. She served on the panel that produced the pathbreaking 2009 report, Reducing Environmental Cancer Risk, What We Can Do Now, which we'll hear a bit more about in today's discussion. Dr. Ted Shetler is a science director for the Science and Environmental Health Network. He practiced medicine for many years in New England and has worked extensively with community groups and NGOs throughout the US and internationally on many aspects of human health and the environment. Ted has authored or co-authored many books, including The Ecology of Breast Cancer, which we'll hear more about today as well. He also serves on the advisory team for CHE, so I have the pleasure of working closely with him in that capacity. So welcome to all our speakers. I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here today to share your experiences working on this critically important issue. I have to say cancer hits close to home for so many of us. Um, we've all heard the statistics that one in eight women in the US will be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point in her life. But these are much more than shocking numbers. These diagnoses touch so very many of us, either ourselves or in our circles of family and friends. I lost my mother, one of my closest friends, and most recently a dear uncle to cancer. I am deeply appreciative of the work you've all done and are doing to promote cancer prevention. So with that, I'd like to invite each of you to share with us the story of how you came to this work, as well as something you're currently focused on, if you like. And we'll start with Polly. Thank you, Kristen. And thanks, everyone, for showing up today. This is just such a treat to see the names of so many people. You all are doing amazing work. And just three of us are featured today, but just feel, feel your energy in this conversation as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit later about the Cancer Free Economy Network, which Kristen mentioned, and also the Cancer Environment Network with Southwest PA that I've been deeply involved in, both of which are very exciting collaborative networks that are across multiple organizations working at this intersection of cancer and environment. 
Um, I want to focus, though, as Kristen invite us to on how we came to this work. And for me, it actually goes way back, because uh, I'm old, to the early days of my career where I was an organizer for Clean Water Action. And we opened an office in Boston. I came up to open it. It was just the beginning of the National Toxics Campaign, which was instrumental in, in establishing and, and refining the Superfund program. So, you know, Lois Gibbs, um, Ann Anderson, many people from across the country living in places that were directly impacted by hazardous waste, which just horrific um, lived experiences. One of those places was in Holbrook, Massachusetts, and I was a community organizer for that community. We established a group called People United to Restore the Environment. Baird McGuire chemical facility there had been mixing and batching chemicals in very shoddy ways for decades. There were drums leaking. There had been chemicals directly dispatched into soil, into water, into the drinking water supply. The buildings were falling down. Um, the site was finally closed and fenced in 1982, but until then there had been no fences and there were children playing on the site. And I got to know really intimately families whose kids were had brain cancers, other forms of cancer, um, other respiratory issues, parents who had never been engaged in environmental issues before who became extraordinary oh. leaders. But at that time, science was not on their side. You might remember Anne Gorsuch, or if you weren't alive then, you read it in history books. She was uh, Ronald Reagan's appointee to the EPA, and she was no friend of communities um, nor environment. And so th this community had science stacked against them. There were a few luminaries, Dick Clapp, Hank Cole, um, others who were performing science on behalf of communities, but very few. And it was that experience that sent me back to graduate school and I got my doctorate in environmental health sciences and health policy um, in public health. And that was my first insight into how siloed the health system is from the environmental side of things, side of the house. And that siloing resulted from the early 70s legislation establishing EPA, et cetera, but it has had its real impacts where the health system hasn't seen it within its purview to address environmental issues. So second story, fast forward 10 years, um, Kristen mentioned how directly we've all been impacted by cancer. My husband at age 34 was diagnosed with testicular cancer and it became a, a you know, real <laughs> a nightmare of seven surgeries, multiple um, rounds of chemotherapy, a major medical error. Um, our daughter youngest was a newborn, we had a five-year-old. It was a very intense time. Um, I was working at World Wildlife Fund at that point after graduate school, um, starting a program on reducing pesticide use and agricultural pollution prevention. And I got to work with Theo Colburn, who many of you know, who was just beginning her work to develop the, the field of endocrine disruption. And she was writing a book, which many of you have read, called Our Stolen Future, co-authored with Pete Myers and Diane Dumanowski. And I was invited to review a draft of that book. And I hadn't had a chance to get to it, so I took it with me in the waiting room while I was waiting for my husband's first surgery uh, for what would become that long journey of testicular cancer. And lo and behold, le began learning about the ways in which testicular cancer incidence has gone up steadily over many years um, and how it's become a much more curable disease. And thank goodness that was the outcome for my husband, but also the role, the very well-established role of environmental carcinogens. So I started thinking about his own exposures. He grew up downstream from a, a munitions factory. He was not breastfed because that was the area where you weren't supposed to breastfeed your kids. So they used well water um, in that plume area from the munitions factory to mix his formula. As a high schooler, he was on a painting team and he spent one summer inside in the hot Baltimore sun, not air conditioned, using solvents to wipe the paint, the old paint off of buildings. And he got so sick, he was hospitalized for 10 days with a toxic exposure. So you know, those issues became quite near and dear um, to me on a personal level. And then the third um, story is that I wound up at Health and Human Services working for Secretary Shalala's science advisor and helping to coordinate at a staff level the President's Task Force on Environmental Health and Safety Risks to Children. And this is a task force that's still alive and well. It was a very exciting time, one of the first health and all policies kind of initiatives that basically premised that every single cabinet level agency had something to do with health and with environment, even if they didn't think they did. So the Justice Department had something to do with it. Transportation and housing, we now understand those are important environmental agencies, but back then we didn't. So it was an experience in learning how strategic convening of multiple sectors, multiple disciplines, multiple perspectives can become very powerful in catalyzing change.
And that um, was also a foundation for the work that I've ended up doing once I got to Lowell um, 2004. So I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you so much, Polly, for sharing sharing that story, those stories, and and we're all grateful that those that that led you the the path that you took and that in doing the incredible work you've been doing in the field for so many years now. Um, Ted, do you want to share how you came to the work that? that sure, you're doing? Kristen. Thank yeah. you, and thank you, thank you all for joining. Uh, well, as Kristen mentioned, I was in clinical practice of medicine for many years, and I was practicing in New England. Uh, and at that time, early on, I was uh, mostly in Maine. Um, and I became really interested in the origins of various kinds of cancer and opportunities for, for prevention. But early on, I found that uh, environmental chemicals and pollutants were largely being ignored by clinicians, with a few exceptions. Um, and uh, environmental causes of cancer were poorly studied and uh, not well understood. And then on a very uh, sort of close to home level, at that time, uh, we and others discovered that main rivers were contaminated with fairly high levels of dioxin that was being dumped a, a result of, uh, of uh, discharges from pulp and paper mills into the rivers. Uh, and it became a, a contentious issue in Maine as to what to do about it. And there were some public hearings held uh, that I decided to participate in as a, as a as a contributor from the public to give public comment. Um, it was at that time that I actually began, began to meet some people who were working in the area of environmental contributors to cancer, including Dick Clapp, who was at those hearings. And uh, I think Theo Colborn was there as well for some of it. Um, and I quickly learned that um, uh, if I was going to uh, participate in this work, I was going to need to get some more training. Uh, and so at that point, I decided to go back to school and get a degree in public health, which I did. Um, and fast forward to now, uh, after many years of working in, at this intersection of cancer and other diseases and the environment, uh, I've been uh, working with the Cancer Free Economy Network that uh, Polly uh, mentioned, uh, working with the health science work group of that uh, network, and also with a newly put together subgroup that is looking at the intersection of climate toxics, health and equity, and looking for opportunities to address the, those intersections. And I'll also just briefly mention that in uh, the last recent couple of years, I was able to serve on an advisory committee for the breast cancer prevention partners as they assembled a breast cancer prevention plan for the state of California. It's called uh, Paths to Prevention and is publicly available. And now they are uh, beginning to implement the plan with considerable uh, community involvement around the state. So we're looking forward to see how that rolls out. So that's my brief introduction, Kristen. Great, thanks so much, Ted. And I wanna point people to the, the webpage for this event in the resources section. Um, we've compiled uh, a, a list of many of the former webinars and calls, including many with the folks that are, that are here, all three of them. And so it's interesting to just get the sense of how long folks have been in this work and, and the different perspectives that they bring, um, that they've brought over the years. So, um, so uh, Margaret, would you like to share with us what your path has been? Yes, thank you, Kristen, um, and good morning or afternoon, everyone, now, depending on where you are. Um, it's a pleasure for me to have been invited to talk to you today and to uh, participate in this celebration of Shay's activities. So thank you for that, Kristen. Um, my background is in immunology of cancer, and I have been in cancer research for, my, for almost my entire career. And most of the time, my laboratory days uh, were spent studying um, skin cancers induced by ultraviolet light and the immunological um, issues surrounding the development of those cancers and the influence of ultraviolet light on the immune system, as it turns out. Um, so in one sense, I've been involved in environmental carcinogenesis for my entire career because, of course, Ultraviolet light is our most ubiquitous environmental carcinogen. But it was only actually many, many years later that I became interested in man-made environmental factors 
uh, associated with the development of cancer. And that came to me really through work that I did with the President's Cancer Panel, um, to which I was appointed in 2003. And um, that was a very eye-opening experience uh, for me, as, as you'll hear in a few minutes. But I, it really opened my eyes to the necessity for raising the visibility of this issue, both within the cancer research community and also in the public. So I continue to be interested in raising the visibility of this issue because I think it's a critically important one and one that has not uh, received a lot of attention in the past. Thank you. Great. Thanks to all of you for sharing those stories. Um, so I want to go ahead and kick off our, our round robin discussion with a question for you, Margaret, about that President's Cancer, Cancer Panel report in 2009. I know Che was involved in bringing the voices of researchers into the process in various ways and, and also in helping to promote the report when it came out to ensure the findings had the broadest audience possible. So can you share a little bit more about the process of working on that report and, and the impact that it had? Yes, it, it, it's a really remarkable story. I mean, the way the panel works is that each year it selects a topic to study, and it spends a year gathering testimony from a variety of sources around the country. And then at the end of that, it writes a report. And one year, we decided to look at environmental factors that might contribute to cancer. Now, I must admit that I was not at all enthusiastic about the study of this topic initially. Um, I, like almost all cancer researchers at the time, was convinced that um, this represented only a very small fraction of human cancers, most of which were acquired in the workplace. And so I, I didn't, wasn't sure that this was sufficiently uh, impactful enough for the study by the President's Cancer Panel. And also, there was a con some concern that, that the evidence for a role of environmental factors was not very strong, and sometimes it was controversial, and sometimes it was contradictory. And so that really limited my enthusiasm for looking at this subject. But we proceeded um, largely because it, this was a subject of enormous public interest. We, we actually got letters from people and said, why, have, why aren't you looking at this? And so um, public interest was very high in the subject matter. And um, this is a subject that had never been studied by the President's Cancer Panel. It had never written a report on this subject in its 40-year history. So um, it, it seemed like it was a, a good time to do that. The other thing was that um, this was not a popular subject in cancer research. It had been in the 1950s and the early 1960s. But once the idea of cancer viruses came along, and once the idea of cancer genes came along, the whole subject of environmental carcinogenesis just went onto the back burner. And so there was nothing really going on in that field. It was completely neglected in among the cancer researchers uh, in that community. So we proceeded and um, we heard lots of testimony from lots of different people and lot who had different interests, but it turned out to be totally shocking to me. I was just stunned by what we heard. And I think the reason for that is that I came into this with a number of assumptions about how things were supposed to work. And, you know, my assumption, one of my assumptions was that chemicals would be tested before they're put on the market. I mean, how, why would you sell something to the public or put it on your grocery store shelves if it hadn't been properly tested? Um, coming from a background where drugs are tested extensively before they're allowed to be used in humans, I just assumed that, you know, chemicals that you put on the Put, put it on the grocery store shelves would be uh, tested also. Well, it turns out that that's really not true. And very few chemicals are tested for cancer-causing activity. And so it, it turns out that until something causes harm to the public, it's not taken off the market. So we only regulate things after they've caused harm, not before they go onto the market, which is what uh, is done in some other countries. 
So that was quite surprising to me. And uh, of course, we have lots of chemicals in our environment, as you know, probably upwards of 80 to 90,000 of them at any given time. So another assumption that I had was that if things were known to cause cancer, they wouldn't be put on the market, or they would be taken off the market, or they would be regulated. And it turns out that that's not really true either. There are substances that are in, um, have been banned in other countries that are widely available here. There are substances that have been declared human carcinogens or probable human carcinogens that are not regulated, that are freely available here. And so this was an assumption that was also um, completely false. And of course, things that are regulated, uh, the regulations are not necessarily enforced very well either. So this was a really eye-opening experience to me. And um, so in our report, we, we speculated that this might be a much more important contributor to cancer incidence than had been previously appreciated. And of course, we were seriously criticized for that conclusion by the scientific community. But there were two factors that really stood out to me in, in thinking about this. One is that the rise in childhood cancers, there has been a steady, slow, steady increase in the incidence of childhood cancers since around the 1950s, which of course is when we started putting chemicals into the environment uh, following the Second World War. So this is very hard to explain without looking at factors in the environment. Um, you know, obviously, newborns who have cancer uh, don't have lifestyle issues that have driven them to, to develop cancer. And so I think this was very, this spoke to me as being an important clue that we should be looking at and pointed to perhaps environmental contaminants as a, as a, a basis. And the second thing that really spoke to me was the realization that we literally live in an ocean of chemicals. And I started to think about, you know, what my life was like when I grew up as a child. We didn't have a lot of, we didn't have pesticides and herbicides and lots of, you know, hundreds of cleaning products and fragrance to, you know, have your socks and your dog smell good. And all of these things have been introduced in my lifetime. Um, and I, you can't help but wonder, what is the impact of all of these chemicals on our daily life and on our, our health and on perhaps on the uh, incidence of cancer? So I've become very interested in, in this subject. And um, I'm very pleased, actually, to see that I think that the subject is beginning, is beginning to get a little bit of attention. And um, there's, I think, increasing evidence of a role of um, pollutants in, in cancer causation. For example, automobile exhaust, um, uh, contaminated water, pesticides, and so on. So I think there's, there's beginning to be very solid scientific evidence that these factors do play a role both in causing cancer and also in contributing to cancer development in a variety, uh, by a variety of mechanisms. So that I think is, is an important progress that we are making. And um, I, I think that the President's Cancer Panel report it certainly stimulated interest. As I said, it was controversial. We were soundly criticized for making a conclusion that, for which we had very little evidence, um, so rightly so. But I think that it served to draw attention to this issue, and I believe that it remains the most widely quoted and most highly read report ever produced by the President's Cancer Panel, so I'm very happy about that. So I'll Stop with that and, and uh, ask Ted to continue and talk about uh, his book on the ecology of breast cancer. Ted? Thank you very much, Margaret. It's a very interesting story. 
Um, so the ecology of breast cancer, why, why the ecology of breast cancer? Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I began to think about uh, breast cancer as an ecologic disorder after I realized that genetic susceptibility and other recognized risk factors just simply didn't explain why many people develop the disease, nor do they explain uh, breast cancer patterns in, in, in entire populations. At that time, uh, migration studies were showing that breast cancer risk remained low in first generation immigrants who moved to a high uh, risk country if they had spent their childhood and adolescence in the low risk country. But the risk in second generation immigrants increased when they lived their entire lives in a higher risk country. And I had also at that time run into a, a paper by an epidemiologist by the name of Jeffrey Rose. The name of the paper is Sick Individuals, Sick Populations. That also seemed important to me. And in that paper, he made this point. He said, asking why a particular person has high blood pressure is a very different question from asking why some populations have more high blood pressure than others. And I thought that the same thing could be said for breast cancer. Why this person has breast cancer is a very different question from asking why some populations have more breast cancer than others. So what makes a, a, a population or a country high risk for breast cancer? And this kind of thinking I had brought to other uh, uh, diseases and conditions such as uh, asthma, neurodevelopmental problems, neurodegenerative disorders, uh, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. It's kind of question that's familiar to ecologists. Uh, they may not, they may be uh, addressing a different topic, but the kind of question is familiar. They might ask what makes a particular ecosystem resilient or vulnerable? Why does ecosystem structure and function uh, sometimes change, often rapidly and irreversibly? So I thought that an ecological model might be useful to bring to think about some of these complex multifactorial diseases. Uh, just briefly, the way I conceive of an ecologic model is uh, of health or disease is that it's multifactorial and multi-level. It sees an individual person progressively nested within a family, a community, and an eco-social system. And time is also an important uh, dimension of an ecological model. Historic time, lifetime, the timing of exposures that might influence health outcomes later in life, vulnerable periods of, uh, of uh, susceptibility with varying latency and disease outcome. All of these are dimensions and, and features of an ecological model of health. So if we begin to apply this model in different populations, we may, we may begin to see differences, not only in individual behaviors, but also individual community and eco-social environments that collectively create conditions, uh, systemic conditions out of which different disease patterns uh, develop. And then changing uh, these system conditions can, can lead to changes in disease patterns. So I attempted to apply that kind of thinking to breast cancer in, in the, the, the book that I wrote. And finally, I would just mention that this all fits fairly well with what we know about cancer biology. Uh, there's a, a model of, uh, of cancer development uh, that was developed by an epidemiologist by the name of Kenneth Rothman called the sufficient component cause model. And it's fairly widely accepted. Uh, Rothman recognized that disease outcomes have multiple contributing determinants within individuals, even down to the cellular and subcellular levels that can act together to produce a, a, a given instance of disease. In this model, um, there are a couple of things to point out. A cause is not a, sing a single component, but it's a minimal set of conditions or events that produce the outcome and that there may be a number of sufficient causes for a, a given disease or outcome to uh, emerge. It, but it also means that until sufficient causes for the disease have come together, there's still an opportunity for prevention. 
And I think that's an important uh, point for us to keep in mind in this discussion. And so we begin to see multiple multi-level opportunities for primary prevention of cancer by interventions that change system conditions in individuals, families, and communities uh, throughout the lifespan in directions that are less favorable for cancer development. So that's an ecologic approach that I think is, is quite useful. So I'm gonna pass it over to Polly to share some highlights of your work with the Cancer Free Economy Network and what uh, the goals of that effort are and what's seeming to gain traction. Thank you, Ted. Um, and thanks both of you for those comments, both of which are really foundational for the Cancer Free Economy Network um, work, both what happened prior, Margaret's efforts, um, which were done in conjunction with a number of people that was organized by Che originally, um, colleagues of mine and Michael and others, Michael Lerner, who gathered together to help put those testimonies together before the President's Cancer Panel, really setting the stage for all the work that's come since. And then Ted, you know, your, your book, and but all your, all your thinking about the ways in which environmental chemicals um, are among the components of an ecosystem that generates cancer. That too has been really fundamental in our understanding of how to try to catalyze change in that system. And that's really what the Cancer Free Economy Network is about. It's a collaborative network grounded in systems change that is devoted to catalyzing change in the current system, which is stuck, stuck in a method, in a mode of producing toxic chemicals, releasing them, exposing people, ranging from those that extract the chemicals and work with them to refine them, work with them in workplaces, releases of them into communities, um, that system of production and then consumption, and then the system of healthcare, which receives people who get sick as a result um, and does its best to treat them, but with very little attention to preventing either those causes of disease or the many others upstream. So the goal of these networks is to understand that system, to find places within it where the dynamics among the players are driving in the wrong direction and those dynamics can be disrupted. And on the other hand, where there are dynamics that are actually going in the right direction and need to be amplified and lifted up. And the concept is if we bring together organizations and players from across the multiple six sectors that participate in the system, that we'll be able to together put pressure in those particular places that seem like good opportunities and, and thus catalyze systems change. So the Cancer Free Economy Network was conceived by the Lowell Center and a number of other partners back in 2014. And we were fortuitous enough to respond to a RFP put out by the Garfield Foundation, which at that point had begun funding collaborative networks grounded in systems change. So an early step in the process of developing the network was to do this systems mapping and understand who the constituencies were and what the dynamics were. And that effort really informed how we set up the CFE and how we structured it. So we currently do our work within three work groups that basically um, align with areas of that systems map. So each work group working with a number of the organizations in that particular arena. So one focuses on shifting the market, the demand and supply of toxic chemicals. Another focuses on impacted communities and people um, and centering their needs um, and their perspectives. And a third focuses on the area of health and science. And that's the one I've been most involved in um, as has Ted and others. There's also cross-cutting initiatives. Ted mentioned the, the Climate Toxicity, Toxics Health and Equity Initiative. There's also been a wonderful initiative called the Childhood Cancer Prevention Initiative to Margaret's point about how dramatic and concerning the increases in childhood cancer are. And that brings together partners from, again, across multiple sectors from the American Sustainable Business Council um, to childhood cancer focused organizations, to pesticides groups, um, to environmental advocates, to clinicians, a real mix of participants. So there are many areas of traction in the CFE that have been very exciting to be part of. I'm just gonna lift up two that I know the best. Um, one is the work of the Health Science Node to influence mainstream cancer organizations. And that came from an analysis of the systems map that 
revealed um, that cancer-focused organizations, whether they be cancer advocacy groups, cancer support groups, cancer research institutions, or cancer-impacted people, are geared toward a focus on treatment and on supporting people who have cancer. And that's understandable. My husband would not be alive today without that kind of attention. That said, there is so much power, political power, financial resources in that segment of institutions that um, are, the systems map suggested that their attention could be amplified to include environmental chemicals so that those could be integrated into cancer prevention initiatives and thereby bring new power to the very good work that was already going on on toxics use reduction. So the health science node has undertaken a number of different activities around that. It really did build off of, as I mentioned, the Che led effort to um, influence those kinds of organizations that had preceded this. A few successes. We issued a joint statement that had a number of luminary public health and cancer focused voices um, calling for action based on concern grounded in science. Margaret was one of those voices. We had American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Medical Association, Latinas Contra Cancer, the APHA, a number of others. And we have used that statement in various contexts. A second one, Margaret was also very involved in as well as TED, which was a three-day standalone meeting by the American Association of Cancer Research, the largest cancer research organization in the world. And it had never held an environmental carcinogenesis focused meeting before. Um, Margaret co-chaired it along with two leading cancer prevention people from Harvard and MD Anderson. And then a number of CFE partners supported it by helping to plan the agenda, convene the speakers, gave some presentations. Key there was that it was a gathering of mainstream cancer researchers. There was a focused special issue of the Journal of Cancer Epidemiology, Biomarkers and Prevention that was published afterwards, which has a great commentary that kind of establishes a narrative for how to think about where we are with the science and the fact that there are pathways to prevention um, before we fully understand um, the science, that we need to continue with both at the same time. The third thing lifting up um, in successes in this arena of, of working with mainstream cancer organizations is an initiative that is funded by the CDC through the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors to have a webinar series targeted at state cancer prevention and control programs within departments of health, and also the state cancer coalitions, which are their constituencies. And those coalitions help the state develop a state cancer plan, which shapes the activities of that office over the course of five years and is funded by CDC. To have, so to have CDC signal to those states that environmental chemicals are really important priorities is new and impactful. And on the other side of organizing those webinars, we have also done organizing, excuse me, in four um, states and hopefully growing. Uh, Ted mentioned the primary prevention of breast cancer report. Um, so there's work in California going on to influence the state cancer coalition around these issues. Also in Iowa, also in Pennsylvania, the Cancer Environment Network of Southwestern Pennsylvania that Molly and I have been very involved in um, working with its state cancer program and finally New York. So that's an example of sort of a, both a top-down and a bottom-up initiative, which we're really excited about. And then some glimmers of hope within the Cancer Moonshot, which held an environment-focused panel uh, that, that Ense and Margaret both presented on in May, just a, an opening for having those issues become part of the Cancer Moonshot. So the second thing I'll lift up is um, the CFE's focus on equity. And that's been a priority that we have stated from the very beginning but it took a while to begin to really get our arms around how could this be done. Initially, we were a network council, a leadership uh, council, primarily of white people. Um, but over time, that, that network council is now primarily people of color. Fred Brown of the Forbes Funds was really instrumental in, in pushing for this and also in helping to develop an emerging leaders cohort, um, which is a team of 12 to 15 young people of color who are mentored by largely leaders of color, although some white folks like me have done it as well, paired around projects that are tied to cancer-free economy network projects and that enable mentees to learn from mentors, but I have to say mentors to learn from mentees, that's for sure, um, in this year-long program that is now a very significant investment by the network and is really getting um, some, some funding, outside funding support and a, a lot of attention for how 
um, do we keep this issue first and foremost and reflect it in our culture, in our leadership, and in our choices about um, what we choose to work on in the world. So those are two of the exciting things going on in the network and um, I'll stop there. Wonderful, thanks Polly and all of you for sharing for sharing the stories of your current work. It's uh, an amazing body of, body of work that has, as you said, Polly, lots of connections with other work that's out there that people are doing and have been doing for years. It's definitely an ecosystem in itself. I, before we turn to the Q&A, um, I want to remind people, if you do have questions, to go ahead and drop them in the Q&A, and we'll have some time uh, to, to uh, pose those questions to our panelists. But first, I wanted to ask each of you to reflect on an article that came out last month in Nature Reviews. Uh, that presented evidence that the incidence of early onset cancer, meaning cancer among people younger than 50, has increased significantly worldwide since the 1990s. So I'm wondering if you just reflect a little bit on the significance of that um, and, and what your thoughts would be. And I want to start with you, Ted. Sure. Thanks, uh, Kristen. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting and provocative article. Uh, the, the name of it is Early Onset Cancer and Emerging Global Epidemic. Uh, and then current evidence and uh, further implications. The authors noted that cancer is multifactorial and it most commonly affects uh, people who are older than 50, but what they noticed is that the incidence of 15 kinds of cancer uh, in parts of the world where data are being collected uh, is actually increasing in people who are younger than 50. Um, and that, uh, was a fairly significant finding, and it was a number of different kinds of cancer uh, that were following this trend. They, they noticed that this was happening in successive birth cohorts since the mid 20th century. And there were uh, 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 this so-called birth cohort effect suggests, according to the authors, an important role for early life risk factor exposures, and is probably attributable to changes in patterns of exposure in early life or young adulthood. So I drew from this the following thoughts that the, fi that the findings are entirely consistent with the ecological model uh, of disease that I previously described. Uh, and uh, I found a quote from the lead author that I'll just, I'll just read because I, I think it, was, it sort of hits the nail on the head. He said that the spike is due to an unhealthy stew of risk factors that are probably working together, some of which are known and others of which need to be investigated. He notes that many of these risks have established links to cancer like obesity, inactivity, diabetes, alcohol, smoking, environmental pollution, Western diets high in red meat and added sugars, not to mention shift work, uh, and lack of energy or lack of sleep. I'm sorry, lack of sleep. So that's the end of the quote. Uh, it's clear to me that some of these are related to individual behaviors, but others are related to the ways we've designed our communities, agricultural systems, our material economies, and economic sectors more generally. Um, and that early life exposures that result from these changes in eco-social eco design can particularly influence disease risk throughout the lifespan. So, uh, you know, again, I think it affirms that disease patterns, including cancer, arise out of system conditions and points that uh, suggest that there are multiple opportunities for cancer prevention at every level. Um, and I welcome thoughts from others. Hey, thank you, Ted. Margaret. Yeah, um, I think this is a really important review. It's really um, very timely and very provocative. The thought that, that cancers in younger age groups are, are current are increasing is really quite important. Um, it points out the changing demographics of cancer and points to um, enormous implications of this for things like cancer screening. You know, there was a controversy a few years ago about how, at what age should you start mammography? And um, if, if cancers are occurring in younger ages, the screening guidelines are going to have to be changed to accommodate that. Um, so the implications of the changing demographics are really, really huge. Um, 
but also cancer treatment. You might make different decisions about treatment if your patient is 80 versus a patient is 40. So, so this, this is really quite an important uh, um, set of, of observations. And of course, it has <laughs> equally enormous implications for the insurance industry, which um, is now going to be looking at a much younger population of cancer patients than it has historically. So I think the, the ramifications of this, of this uh, information is just really huge. Um, the second thing is that, as Ted mentioned, this article points out the complexity uh, involved in trying to sort out causal factors for cancer. There are all of these uh, um, com not competing factors, but contributing factors, probably all of which play a role in one case or another. And so I think it, it illustrates in a very uh, substantive way how complicated this is and how uh, difficult prevention is actually going to be. It does, of course, give a nod to, it acknowledges that environmental factors may be one of these uh, items that participates in causation. And I was very encouraged by that because I think had this article been written five years ago, it wouldn't have said that. And so I'm encouraged that, that uh, it, there was even a mention of environmental chemicals, pollutants in the environment as, as being a potential um, uh, contributor to the cancer problem. And so I view this as a kind of a a foothold in the door looking at environmental factors as a pathway for prevention. Great, thank you so much, Margaret. And Polly. Uh, yeah, those are great comments and I'll, I'll build on Margaret's last point. Um, as she said, I think this really is a, an important tip of the hat to the role for environmental contaminants that are among the risk factors for early onset cancers that should be considered I think the fact that it was primarily a tip of the hat and not a deep dive reflects the research interests and backgrounds of most of the co-authors. Um, and also a dominant narrative that diet, smoking, the lifestyle factors are really the primary environmental contributors for which we have evidence. Um, so it does leave the impression that the opportunities for primary prevention with regard to environmental factors are primarily in that arena of lifestyle. And I think um, to me, it reiterates the importance of all of us having a, a both and message in as we try to shift narratives. So it, both treatment and prevention with environmental chemicals being part of it, both lifestyle, so-called lifestyle factors, um, which need individual action and systems action. And as Ted pointed out, that that's a really great aspect of this article that it does talk about the systems level needs, but both those lifestyle factors and um, environmental chemicals. And I did meant, forget to mention in my earlier review of the work, um, an example of a resource for this. I think we organized um, with a number of partners, the Forum on Cancer and Environment, which was a series hosted by Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Silent Spring Institute, the Lowell Center and others. And the purpose was really to, to target the same audience that this article targets, um, which is clinicians, researchers, others you know, in the field to really present both the foundation of scientific evidence, but also reflections on narrative and how clinicians and scientists play an outsized um, and, some, and a role that they're sometimes not aware of in how they speak about these issues. So that series of three two-hour seminars on cancer environment linkages, I think are really useful resources for all of us in um, learning how to amplify the messages beyond um, diet and, and um, smoking and other lifestyle factors. Another thing I'd say about the article is it's an example of the importance of review articles. Um, I think seeking out review articles, which synthesize studies that look at similar questions, that's my approach for staying on top of a literature that thankfully is getting bigger and bigger. You know, we track through the Cancer Environment Network of Southwest PA, the, the literature on cancer environment every month, and there's always at least 20, 25 scientific peer-reviewed articles on environmental chemicals and cancer. That's a lot to keep track of. Review articles do a, a great job at taking a step back and helping people to interpret a body of literature. Um, and this is one of those. 
it can really illuminate trends also that otherwise might get lost in the weeds. And this is an example of a trend of early onset cancers that they're illuminating, which is really important, really powerful. And there are a number of other trends that um, have been lifted up by review articles. I will note that there are two early onset can uh, cancers that they didn't talk about. One is childhood, which we've mentioned a few times here and they, they didn't cover that. Um, but the second was testicular from my own experience, another cancer that um, has, it generally hits young men anyway, um, but therefore it's an early onset cancer with strong environmental ties. And the last thing I, I would say about it was it, it does flag something that I think is really important. And that is the need for better information about exposure to environmental contaminants. And we all know that epidemiology is a very blunt instrument. And so when you do see um, relationships that appear to be associative or causal in the epidemiological literature, that's a big deal because it's really not a very good tool to try to discern those signals. But the better the exposure information, the less blunt that instrument will be. So I'll take um, fracking as a good example, right? There's, there's solid early science on associations between exposures to fracking chemicals and childhood leukemias, for example. But the measure for exposure has simply been proximity to some sort of operation, whether it be a wellhead or other things related to fracking. Well, those are becoming so ubiquitous, it's very hard to discern differences in exposure just by measuring proximity. So we need to do a much better job of getting more specific about what exposures have been, including biomonitoring for um, evidence of impacts on the body, um, biomarkers for precursors of development to, to disease, particularly um, as it relates to cancer, which has such long uh, latency. And I'm reminded of how important the existence of biomarkers of exposure for tobacco and biological response, how key those were in the winning of the tobacco wars. So thanks for lifting that article up, Christy. Really, really important to reflect. Yeah, well, thanks for all the insightful comments and um, thoughts that that spurred and that you all shared. We're, we're running a little bit behind. We do have some, some excellent and intriguing questions. And so I'm, we probably will go a little bit over the hour because I want we won't get to all of these, but I'd like to get to a few of them. Um, so I hope folks will be patient with that. Um, I wanted to start out, and it's a good segue from your last comment, uh, Polly, uh, a question from Richard Clapp, who many of you know. He says, could one or more of you comment on the pattern of smoking cessation and its impact on the overall decline in cancer incidence and mortality? It's both an example of how prevention works and how other environmental exposures become relatively more important in the overall cancer burden. Anyone like to speak to that? Well, I'll take a crack at it and then I'd love to hear others, but um, just because we, I was involved in a study that was led by Doug Myers and David Kriebel, um, and this may have been what Dick was uh, hoping we would address. Um, and it was a really interesting study to take a look at counties across the country to uh, model smoking data um, and to discern uh, under a scenario of complete elimination of smoking, if we had done that 20 years ago, what would be happening to cancer incidence rates now? And would the impact on cancer incidence rates of eliminating smoking vary across counties? And the conclusion was that the, reduct the elimination of smoking would have a huge and important impact on reducing cancer incidence. And I should say that the focus of the study was on the 12 cancer types that are known for uh, to, to be associated with smoking. So these are smoking related cancers. So the first conclusion was it's really important and we should keep doing it. Um, we shouldn't stop focusing on tobacco cessation. But the second conclusion was that that reduction in incidence did vary substantially across counties. So in a follow-up publication, we looked at Allegheny County in Southwestern Pennsylvania. We looked at lung cancer incidence rates. And whereas the elimination of smoking would reduce lung cancer incidence on average 62% across all counties in the US. In Allegheny County, that would reduce lung cancer incidence only 10.6%. So that raises the question, what else is going on in those counties? And there's now a follow-up study to, um, to look at that. But in Pennsylvania, for example, some good candidates are air pollution, which is much higher there than in other places, and radon. Pennsylvania is the third um, highest state in terms of radon. 
uh, exposures of any state in the country. Ted or Margaret, any additional thoughts on that? No, just just the obvious ones is that that um, smoking cessation has been the huge success for prevention of cancer. It's really the the best illustration that prevention actually you know really does work and that you can make an impact. The other message from that is that it took a very long time to show that in terms of of uh, statistics and actually looking at at the numbers starting to drop. But it's had an enormous impact on um, the the overall incidence of cancer, and uh, I think points to the power of what prevention can do if you can apply it appropriately. Great, thank you. I'm going to move us on to the next question, if that's all right, Ted. Um, sure. Yeah. I didn't have a chance to jump in. No, no. This is from uh, Lorene Hackett. She says, as EPA is set to only regulate two PFAS. Given the many studies strongly linking PFAS to various cancers, how concerned are you they aren't regulating them more quickly or as a class group, given there are over 12,000, particularly for prevention? Anyone want to tackle that one? Yeah, I, I'll just mention that uh, I, I'm very concerned, and it, it shows the deficiencies of the regulatory uh, regime here in the United States. Um, we really should be thinking about PFAS as a class. Um, and um, rather than looking at these one at a time or two or three at a time, and then asking ourselves, uh, what are some of the essential uses and which uses can we get rid of? Uh, because we're going, to, we're, spending, we're going to spend years uh, doing risk assessments on these so-called forever chemicals. Uh, and we now have evidence that from a very recent publication that um, if, if you look at where uh, PFAS have been used in the various applications, like in firefighting foams and uh, so on, uh, it's likely that uh, groundwater and drinking water sources are contaminated with PFAS uh, substantially all around the nation, not just where they've been measured, but literally uh, all around the nation. And they aren't going, going away anytime soon. Uh, I think there, it's an excellent example of, of, of how we need to re revise our regulatory approach um, and, and begin thinking about groups of chemicals and thinking about what are essential uses and which ones aren't. Great. Yeah, thanks for that, Ted. And I want to put in a plug. We have an upcoming webinar with the EDC Strategies Partnership on November 2nd about that article that Ted just mentioned that shows the presumptive contamination based on PFAS use that is so widespread across the country. Um, so I want to sneak in two more, two more of the questions. Um, one from Ann Sullivan, who notes in a, in a couple of different comments, uh, flags the exposure of infants to plastics through toys and, and plates and cups and bottles and so on, and then asks, why can't the American Academy of Pediatrics and medical schools include this kind of information? Any thoughts on that? Well, I'll, I'll just briefly mention that there are a few medical schools that are beginning to include this kind of information in their curricula. Um, and there are increasing numbers of medical students who are informed and very interested in this. And so I think those are hopeful signs. The problem in uh, medical schools generally is that the curricula are already filled up. It's kind of a, a, a battle to find time and place for new material to be introduced. But I am gratified to see uh, in some medical schools that uh, medical students are uh, calling for this kind of information and are actually in, uh, developing their own uh, seminars and uh, uh, formats for, for bringing these, this, this information forward. Great, thank you. Kristen, that's an idea for Che maybe is to collect the resources from those curricula um, that are happening in various places, put them in one place so people could tap into them. Yeah, no, interesting idea. Uh, so one final question from um, the Commonwealth's president and one of Che's co-founders, Michael Lerner. 
he, Michael says, Susan Braun, past CEO of the Jimmy V Foundation for Cancer Research, funded a good deal of research by veterinary oncologists on companion animals, dogs, who tend to get the same cancers as their owners. Should this be a useful ancillary, ancillary source of evidence for our community or not? Is anyone looking at this work? Comments from any of you on that? I think it is an important source of information. Uh, and I have recently done a quick literature review just to see what, what's being published after having a conversation with Michael about this not too long ago. And um, uh, it is getting some attention in the medical literature, uh, but it's, it's not widespread, but it's suggesting that there are some really re interesting research opportunities here uh, for both exposure analysis, but also for outcome analysis. So I, I, I think it's going to be an emerging area of interest. Any, any other comments, Polly, Margaret, on that question? Oh, okay. Great. Well, I know we're at the hour. I appreciate patience from everyone for us going a little over. This has been a really rich conversation and I was reluctant to, to cut things off. Um, I have a few just quick housekeeping notes and then we'll hand it back to our panelists for some final words. I encourage you to, to hang on for a few minutes if you can. Um, so at first I wanted to flag, if you'd like to dive deeper into this issue, you'll find a collection of the resources um, that were mentioned at many of them, as well as uh, previous related webinars and call recordings on the webpage for today's event. And I'll drop that in the chat in a moment. Uh, I also wanted to let you know, we have two webinars coming up next week. One that we are co-sponsoring with many partners marking the 60th anniversary of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. That's on Tuesday, October 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And I'll drop a link into the chat um, as well for those interested in more details. And then on Wednesday, October 26th at 11 a.m. Pacific, Che Alaska will host a webinar on the risks of mining to salmon and trout bearing watersheds in the Pacific Northwest. And you can find a link to register at healthandenvironment.org. Just look for the upcoming webinars on our homepage. Uh, we also have an EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, as I mentioned, coming up on Wednesday, November 2nd, that will focus on that latest uh, science on PFAS and, and PFAS exposure across the country. Um, and our next Che Cafe will be a conversation with Linda Birnbaum and Ami Zota. Uh, about the importance of multidiscipl multidisciplinary equity-based approaches to environmental health. And that's set for Friday, December 2nd. Keep an eye out for details on that, and I hope you'll join us. Um, we'll also be celebrating Che's 20th anniversary with a hybrid in-person online event at Commonweal in Bolinas on Saturday, November 12th, featuring Pete Myers, Tyrone Hayes, and many others. And you can find a link to this event on our homepage. We'd love to have you join us either in person or on Zoom. Um, and if you're inspired to make a donation to support Che's ongoing work, you'll find a donate button at the top of our website as well. So with that, I'd like to turn back to our panelists with a final question. So we all know this work is hard and requires a commitment to be in it for the long haul. Uh, what is it that keeps you motivated and what gives you hope? Margaret, let's we'll start with you. Yeah, I think what keeps me motivated is outrage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think people ought to know what's in their drinking water. They have a right to know, you know what, what's in the air that they're breathing. And so that keeps me motivated. And I heard a, a, a vignette from a young man years ago, and again, in conjunction with the report for the President's Cancer Panel. And he said that he had watched all of his lifestyle factors. He was probably 30 years old, maybe 30 years old. And he had been healthy, he had eaten well, he had exercised, he you know, didn't use alcohol or any drugs, and he was really on the straight and narrow in terms of lifestyle factors. And he still got cancer. And he was just incensed that he had done, thought he had done everything right, and he still got cancer. And of course, I think it was bladder cancer, which is well known to be associated in some cases with uh, um, pollute, pollute water pollution. And so that's the kind of thing that keeps me motivated. It, it's the people should, should have a right to know that they have safe water and safe air and safe food and uh, a safe environment to live in. Thank you so much, Margaret. And Ted, what are your thoughts? <laughs> 
Um, well, uh, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, I see versions of an ecologic framework uh, increasingly adopted, actually, not only in research study design and data analysis, but also in developing strategies for public health interventions. Uh, and so it's gratifying to see, for, for me to see that uh, gain more traction. And the second thing is that I'm really uh, pleased to see well-trained and younger scientists and clinicians who are uh, bringing not only new methods uh, and enthusiasm to the research and, and practice, but also willing to work uh, with other advocates, urging uh, health protective changes in local and state and federal uh, policies. So uh, that's uh, evidence of uh, a favorable direction from my point of view. Thanks, Kristen. Wonderful, thank you, Ted. Polly, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I can't say I'm optimistic, but to me, that's different than having hope, um, which is how you framed it, Kristen, which I appreciate is um, there are a lot of bad signals out there in the world. Um, that said, uh, there there are also good ones. And the polls, the recent research done by Celinda Lake for um, Tracy Woodruff's group that suggests that the, the polarization that we apparently have in certain areas um, is not reflected in in the issues that we are talking about today, that there is a lot of common ground around people's concern and sense of outrage like Margaret mentioned. And, and those are things that we can build upon. There's also to me the impact that we're seeing um, in from many organizations, but given that I'm focused on networks, I'll mention just a couple today and healthcare without harm and the way in which it's been able to move this, this large behemoth of a health sector in terms of taking very impactful steps in, in these areas, the Healthy Building Network, um, doing the same with Healthy Building Materials. Children's Environmental Health Network was just celebrated 30 years of amazing work in that realm, CFE, of course. Um, just really exciting to see um, how patience, determination, um, and relationships have resulted over a long period of time in, in real impact. And I guess that's where I, I would close in terms of um, a sense of how, how you hang in this for the long haul is relationships. I mean, look at, at least for me, the energy and joy that I feel by being on this call with all of you, including everyone who hasn't had a um, verbal voice on this call. It's just um, necessary for the work to build relationship with individuals and organizations. And it's absolutely crucial to sustaining a sense of energy and joy um, in the work. So I really appreciate the opportunity I've had to have all of these relationships. That is a wonderful note to close on. Thank you so much, Polly. And, and thanks so much to all of you for your incredible work promoting cancer prevention and, and supporting environmental health and justice more broadly. Uh, thanks for taking the time to be here today with us. And also thanks to everyone for your great questions, for being part of this community um, and for joining us for today's Che Cafe. Thank you so much.